The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Hi. Uh, ask any questions along the way. Don't hold them until the end. The whole notion is to try and make this something that's relevant for you. I speak all the time. I guess this is okay. Uh, if you can't hear me, just let me know. Uh, I speak all the time on a variety of topics related to Linux and intellectual property. And uh, I run something, I'll give you some background just so you have a better understanding of, uh, of the context in which I operate and what I do. And then that'll help you understand how we're attempting to uh, leverage the uh, wonderfully elegant, self-organizing, self-regulating entity that is the Linux community. Um, if you study complexity theory, um, as I have, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's amazing to have uh, uh, to be working in this environment and be supporting and attempting to enable the community, which is really all that I do. Um, the whole notion is to be as, uh, <clears throat> as egoless as possible. Uh, it's a time and place uh, event, but about eight years ago, companies like IBM and Red Hat recognized that, uh, that there was an inherent vulnerability associated with, uh, with open source and with Linux. And, uh, I think they recognized that uh, with all this openness came the opportunities for mischief for those who don't necessarily support openness and uh, creativity and innovativeness in the way that can be developed, the discontinuities, the discontinuous innovation that's truly impactful that can come about from open source collaboration. Uh, those companies that were very happy with the status quo and still are and struggle to, uh, uh, to avoid the inevitable and have not developed uh, open source strategies, don't understand how to operate in an open source world. Those entities at that time were starting to look at this as an anomaly. Um, and in fact, uh, if you look at the, the, the quotes that uh, are often trotted out about personal computing in the early 70s by IBMers about it being somewhat of a novelty and something that would never really expand, and be, uh, have any real traction in the, in the world. Uh, you look at Bill Gates's quotes in, the, uh, in 99 and 98 about open source and about Linux, and they're eerily similar. Uh, I think what that, the lesson there is that uh, the, more, the more successful you are, the more sedentary you become in your perspective, and, how, and the more difficult it is to be able to break the frame of reference to be able to allow you to reperceive the future. Uh, or the, 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 uh, the present in his case. And so uh, those companies that uh, were antagonistic to Linux, that still are antagonistic to Linux, decided uh, on an ad hoc basis that they would look to fund litigation by third party entities. Um, and so the SCO lawsuit from the early part of the last decade was a wake up call to large companies and uh, even though at that point, if you look at the, in the 92, 93, 94, or 03, 04, 05 time frame, uh, the number of developers uh, inside large companies versus outside large companies was disproportionately outside large companies. Now, if you look at the latest Linux Foundation data, I think the number is up around 68% of developers that are coding and developing in, in support of Linux. Uh, not all of open source, but just Linux, are actually inside uh, medium to large companies. And so there's been a shift, um, and, and these companies like IBM in particular recognized in 99 when they made their first billion dollar investment in, in open source and in Linux, that this was coming and it was gonna be very important. And it was significant because it created an opportunity for, the, for societal benefit to accrue in a way that had never occurred before. The whole idea of, uh, if you look at um, the work of Ken Arrow and Brian Arthur at, uh, at Stanford, um, uh, they're both alive, uh, Ken Arrow's quite old, Brian Arthur is uh, not quite old, as old, but uh, an interesting guy. Uh, they developed the whole notion of increasing returns, which is the economic base of where, where network effects come from, which we kind of tend to call 
for short here, and that work affects the value creation of one plus one plus one doesn't equal three anymore when you bring smart people together around a problem or a project uh, and uh, allow them to be creative. Uh, Lou Platt, who ran HP for about 15 years, uh, his notion of, uh, of this was inside a company, which was a more limited model, was that you bring a bunch of people, hire a bunch of smart people, put them in a room and hope they mate. Um, and uh, it's a crude way of describing the creativity and innovative pro innovation process, but in, I think it gets the point across that uh, you, you have people, that, when you bring people together, whether it's over a network or it's face to face, you create an opportunity for new novel to, to be created, which is really what drives an economy. Incremental innovation, new versioning of an old platform is not necessarily where we see major shifts in economic growth and, and, and the interconnectedness, the globalization. Uh, having worked as a diplomat for a dozen years and, and been involved in the administration of aid programs, I can tell you that uh, there's, a, there's a fundamental problem with aid um, this is a program, open source in general, is a societal social shift that actually allows for people to engage globally and for the world to be connected so that we don't have the inefficient use of capital in siloed organizations um, and redundant production of, tech, of base technology, but rather through collaboration. We've broken down a lot of the concerns that existed in the 60s and 70s where companies were afraid to, to even talk to themselves because of the fear of, uh, of reprisal from the Justice Department for uh, undue collaboration and, uh, and uh, behaviors that would be detrimental from an antitrust standpoint to the, uh, to the consuming population. And I think as we've gotten over that hump, we've now created an opportunity for this social dynamic to, uh, to pertain, which is it's really, really important that I think it is a social dynamic because it's not something that's, that's reversible. Uh, much as companies that are supporting proprietary platforms would like it to be a pure technology that could be displaced by an alternative technology, Linux is not about that and open source is not about that, which is why it's so seductive and so powerful and why it represents it, why we are now in a transition point going from, uh, again, that inefficient use of capital where control of capital and ideas and innovation really were with the G8 company, companies that existed in the G8 countries to now a much more global engagement so that the sm smartest of smart people around the world get to participate around these platforms and contribute. Um, and it allows for all kinds of other dynamics in terms of the localization of products. There was a term in the technology industry in the late 90s called uh, software definable radio where devices became an extension of us. It was a vision that we are finally starting to realize with, uh, with smartphones and we'll, we'll, the ultimate culmination of that vision will only be brought forward by open source where devices will ultimately be customized in, in local environments so that they're uniquely uh, utilitarian for people who speak certain languages or dialects or inter utilize information in certain ways. The, the device itself, the hardware, becomes only a vessel to be manipulated and to be uh, 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 co-opted to be more, more suited to work and play in regions around the world by people, uh, depending upon their particular predispositions, nationalities, identity, and language. And so, nine years ago, eight years ago, uh, IBM and Red Hat got together and said, we're gonna to have to do something extraordinary because we can't let nature take its course because this is too powerful a force for the likes of large companies to, uh, that support proprietary platforms to allow to continue unabated. And the SCO lawsuit where funding came from Microsoft to support litigation uh, by a third party company uh, was something that again was a wake up call for them. And so what they said is, let's get together with a bunch of other companies and do something that's completely selfless. Um, if you think about Intel's strategy historically from the, uh, the mid 80s onward, Intel was never that concerned about AMD. Um, if AMD didn't exist, they would have had to create them. Um, so AMD was, was helpful in that they allowed them to escape the bright spotlight of, of antitrust for a long time. Uh, but Intel was always concerned with create the market, more devices, that, that was their mantra. Whenever 
I would meet with them on a bilateral basis in Washington or in, in Silicon Valley or in Tokyo or Paris or wherever else I was in the world working on it from a, a governmental standpoint. The whole message with them is let's just get more devices in people's hands. We need more penetration of PCs. We need more mobile devices out in the world. And then we're comfortable that we're going to be able to compete for our part of, that, of the pie. Sometimes they're correct, as they have been in the PC space, where they've never had less than 56% market share uh, in any generation. It hasn't turned out so well for them in the, uh, in the, the handheld space. But, uh, but in balance, what they saw is what the people at IBM and, and Red Hat and then Sony and NEC and Philips and Novell, they all recognized that they had to contribute real money to allow for uh, this wonderfully, wonderfully, as I said, self-organizing, self-regulating community uh, that has neither a head nor a tail to actually have a surrogate for what normally exists in an individual company that represents a technology movement, which is a, a patent portfolio that allows for uh, detente to be maintained. So the, the challenge was how do we build a sufficient patent portfolio that allows us to utilize that portfolio for defensive purposes to keep large companies who are, are antagonistic to Linux and antagonistic to the kind of creativity and innovation that Linux and open source can generate, how do we basically put, keep them in check uh, so that their behaviors are ones that are not able to rob people and vendors of choice, which is really what I do on a daily basis. I just make sure that there's choice out there. What I had is Open Invention Network, and it was the result of that eight year ago, nine year ago brainstorm between Red Hat and IBM. And then they brought in these other players. They contributed tens of millions of dollars uh, on day one to this. And there's a like commitment. This is a very unusual, there's no precedent for Open Invention Network's existence. It's not an industry association. Uh, it represents a community. I have six board members. The companies that I mentioned sit on my board, but I don't do anything directly for them. Uh, which is very unusual. They put all the money in, uh, but what I do is support the weakest links in the chain, the distributions that are vulnerable that can be preyed upon. It's, the, it's, a, it's a very old model, but uh, the antelope that, uh, that wander off and, uh, and stray are the ones that get pounced on and, and, uh, and made into a meal. And that's essentially what goes on in industry, is if you stray from the pack and you're not part of, a com part of this community, uh, you can be turned. There are, I, I have many, many stories of uh, companies being approached and told, you know, you're going to use this distribution versus th this distribution if you maintain Linux, or you're not going to maintain, or, you're, or we're going to sue you, and we'll use our portfolio to basically drive you out of business. Uh, a lot of the behavioral quirks that you used to see from Cisco in the, in the, in the mid to late 90s before they kind of understood uh, how, um, how uh, the intellectual property space worked and they became a believer that they had to have IP. Those are the same kind of behaviors you saw from, from companies like Microsoft and you continue to see to this day. And uh, in, in some ways you almost have to be empathetic, not sympathetic, but empathetic because it's very difficult, just extremely difficult to create an industry um, and to uh, ev watch it evolve and not have the ability, this, the internal sense-making skills to be able to navigate with it so that you can maintain uh, a position of primacy. Uh, but the discontinuity that, that open source re represents is one that has challenged these uh, traditional organizations to uh, to really adopt the strategy. When David Einhorn, who's one of the lead investors in, in Microsoft two, three weeks ago, uh, made a comment calling for uh, Steve Ballmer's head, we had exchanged emails and, and the basic three-line email is, if you don't have an open source strategy, you're not gonna be relevant long-term. That's just the way it is. And he understands that. He's an extremely bright, high-twitch, uh, intolerant individual who runs a hedge fund and they're the large, he's the third largest private investor in, uh, in Microsoft behind Balmer and Gates in terms of the shareholding. And so he's, he's constantly pushing them 
on issues like this to develop a strategy. It's, it's only one of the, the challenges he has, but, um, but it's, or one of the concerns he has, but it is one of those concerns that even, that smart people recognize that if you're gonna run a company in this day and age, you have to understand how you interact in the open source community, how you participate, how you create value, how you partner. These are things that are very difficult for companies that are essentially natural or artificial monopolists. Uh, and so, um, while we can be empathetic, at the same time, we need to make sure that those behaviors don't, uh, don't become ones that rob the community of choice. Again, the vendor has to have choice in what they're going to choose to put out in the marketplace. Uh, the carrier, if it's a, we're talking about telecommunications networks, have to have choice, and their customers need choice. And our whole goal is to ensure that that choice exists. And so, one thing that we've started to do is, as in addition to buying patents and then making them available royalty free, um, we've started a number of programs designed to attempt to uh, protect the community uh, and to leverage the community. One thing about, uh, uh, about the double E world versus the computer science world where most coders come from, the latter community, is that uh, the sanctity of the engineering notebook in the double E world, you're really socialized with that during uh, undergraduate and graduate school. Whereas in computer science, if it doesn't appear in code, it doesn't exist. And unfortunately, code is not searchable as a form of prior art. Um, while people might like to think that Google is, uh, is capable of, of everything, they are capable of a lot, and there are some very creative people at Google. Unfortunately, right now, uh, at the present day, uh, code is not searchable, and as a result, it, there is no record of invention. And there has been no record of invention for 20 years now. Um, unfortunately, when, when Richard Stallman uh, was proselytizing as far back as the mid to late 60s about the value of open source, um, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't find fault with Richard's view on this, but his ex explanation to me is when you're ushering in a movement, you need simple messages and you, need, you don't want to complicate things by having qualified kind of views on issues like, like, uh, like patenting. He doesn't believe, obviously, that patents should exist in, in, the, in the software space, but at the same time, uh, there was another qualification that could have been introduced, but because of the need to drive a, tr a total transformation in thinking of how people invent and how they create value in, a, in, a con in an economy, I think Richard took, took the path of throwing, a, throwing the baby out with the bathwater a little bit by encouraging a whole generation of people not to think about patenting. And not patenting is not something I have a problem with. Uh, the problem I have is that we haven't created a record of inventiveness. That record of inventiveness would have, would have precluded probably thousands of patents of being, of being issued in the United States alone. And uh, there are software patents that have been issued, even though the Europeans say that they're not supporting software patents, there are still thousands of software patents across the European jurisdictions in the patent and trademark world. And so uh, it was a... Uh, it was a calculated move that had a very positive effect in terms of clear, concise message, open source, changing the way of life, changing a way of creating value in an economy. Simple but complex, took a long time to ultimately get there. And then, you know, Linus came along as kind of the golden child with the, the most significant of all the several thousand technology open source programs, to me it's the tip of the spear. So by supporting Linux, so goes Linux, so goes open source as a modality for invention, which is what I really view it as. Um, and so that's why whatever we do in Linux, I view as having a, uh, uh, an, an, a um, correlative effect on what happens in the, uh, in the overall uh, world of open source as, a, again, this, this modality of development and of creating value. And so, uh, we have created a variety of mechanisms of attempting to uh, re-engage the community around the importance of contribution, not the importance of patenting, but the importance of contribution and codification of inventiveness. 
so that it's not buried and lost in code, but it can be re-articulated and made accessible and made useful so that we can stem the, uh, the flow of, uh, of new patents in software um, that are merely um, uh, taking ideas and inventiveness that have, have been codified or that, that are in code but have never been made accessible so that they can't serve as a, as a bar. Um, so the, the Linux community is essentially a, a massive resource. It's tens of millions of people that are ultimately ac have access to be able to contribute. And they've got all this passion, all this knowledge, and, and you know, there's an integrity, there's, a, uh, there's an authenticity about the community which you, you can't bottle. It's just, uh, it's just incredibly powerful. Um, early in my career, when I was a diplomat, it was really, uh, my own personal motivation then was making the world safe for democracy. Now I've kind of come full circle and I'm making the world safe for the democratization of innovation, um, which is far more powerful um, than anything I've ever done. And so it excites me every day to play a part in enabling smart people to create value in, in this unique way. But what I'm also trying to do, in, in addition to the creativity in, in code and, and product and development and and, uh, and technology that ultimately results from this contribution to also leverage these same characteristics to actually allow for patent issues to be dealt with more effectively. Uh, I described a little bit of this, but you, what OIN does is you've got these industrial companies that have come together with no personal gain. And one of the first things I did when I was recruited to take over this role three and a half years ago was, was ask the question of every one of the companies is there another shoe that's going to drop? Am I going to be asked to do something for any of these companies? Um, and it, you know, true to their word, I've not been asked to do one thing for one individual thing for any one of these companies that support this. Uh, and that's why it's a, it's a highly unusual and, uh, and potentially very powerful um, uh, uh, counterbalance to uh, to uh, the the behaviors of large companies that support proprietary platforms that are not not on board with uh, with a strategy to be able to participate in in Linux uh, or an open source. And so, what we're trying to do is really create a patent no fly zone. Um, we're not 100% effective, but but you know some of the things that you there's just a session that I was in on. Uh, listening to uh, from a, a PhD student at the University of Georgia on, um, on the whole social component of the value of, of, of the net and the value of contribution and collaboration, which I think is very important. And in that session, there was, a, uh, there was some comments on, uh, um, on how one has this, this goal of kind of creating a, uh, an environment where we're, in, where we're um, where we're continuing to contribute and, and free and open uh, and allowing for access uh, for all people. And I think that's very important. And I think, you know, lifeline services, there are a number of other ways where we're extending out service for, uh, for internet access that parallels what we used to consider voice access was the only thing that warranted uh, lifeline services, but now we're expanding it out. Um, and so, what we're essentially doing is, is acquiring patents that are relevant to companies that, uh, again, that are antagonistic to Linux. We have patents that they need if they want to continue to operate their business. We only acquire patents that are, um, that are by virtue of their value or their power against other companies um, are incredibly useful in enabling Linux and enabling freedom of action in Linux. So we acquire patents. We have over 300 plus patents now. We, we, we do directed invention work. We work with universities, um, uh, with individual inventors. Uh, we acquire small, medium-sized enterprises where necessary that, have, that are patent rich. We retain the, uh, the lead inventors in those companies. Uh, we, we bought a virtualization company uh, a year and a half ago that uh, where we still have the CTO on board and he's inventing for us. Um, and we develop shadow roadmaps for where Linux is going um, and are looking to constantly be ahead of Linux uh, 
so that uh, that we're creating this this path of, uh, of freedom of action and freedom to operate. Uh, we also are creating defensive publications. I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, and, and what's happening in 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 a non-Linux society in, the, in just core technology companies is actually quite beneficial to us. You have a lot of invention that people are moving away from raw numbers, which is a good thing. So uh, there's generally a focus now on let's file only on things that are more fundamental inventions and let's, let's not build patent families. The traditional way of filing, of developing patents is that because you can only reward, quality is a very difficult master to, to reward. So because you can't reward quality, most, most large companies and their intellectual property departments reward people based on how many patents they file and how many get granted in a given year, um, which creates some of the natural distortions that we have in, in the world as we see it now with uh, uh, record numbers of patents being issued over the last 20 years. <clears throat> Uh, and so, uh, because of that distortion, you now have a situation where you've got lots of patents out there, not a, not a good way of controlling what's created inside organizations because you can't really measure quality, and you get a sh you, but you have a reaction now, which is a shift. Most areas are such, the technology inventiveness is, um, is, is happening at such a pace that you can't develop a, a fundamental patent or two, and then all these sibling, sister, child patents around it to protect it. Because you have core invention and you have claim scope. And in the first couple of inventions in a technology area, you have the broadest claims. And then you start to think about other ways that you could use this and you start to invent out from there. Um, what, what companies are doing now, like IBM and uh, Philips and, and Motorola and Siemens and Ericsson and uh, uh, scores of other companies, what they're doing is creating creating defensive publications, which are statements of invention, wrapping their core inventions with those contemporaneous with the filing of the core invention as a patent. And so the defensive publications protect their patents in the way that the child or sibling, uh, sibling patents would, uh, but it allows you to develop your portfolio very quickly uh, and your defensive positioning very quickly. We provide our patents royalty free so that anyone who wants a license can have a license. There's no charge for the patents. The only thing you have to agree is good hygiene reciprocity within the community. That if you're gonna take our patents and have a license to those for free, then it's royalty free, there's no fees of any kind, no dollars to change hands. You just have to agree it's in terms of consideration and consideration is, a, is very important in this from a legal standpoint because the conveyance is not fails for lack of consideration because it's a contract. And in any contract you have to have uh, consideration. And so what we do is uh, require that companies that take a license uh, be in a position where they will provide access to everyone else in the community that takes a license. Uh, their patents that read on the Linux definition, and we're in the process of redefining what Linux is based on uh, a pretty thorough analysis of, of all of the new um, Linux-based platforms like Android and, uh, and WebOS and, and, uh, and others. And, uh, and so the other obligation is that you agree not to sue based on Linux grounds. Now Oracle sued against, uh, against Google um, in the way that we look at the Linux definition, when you take technology, this is an interpretation, it's not necessarily a statement of fact, but it's an interpretation. When you take proprietary technology and you embed it or thread it into an open source platform, uh, you haven't uh, been able to uh, absolve yourself of liability or responsibility to deal with the, uh, with the misappropriation of that technology if you don't have a license. And so that may be the way that case comes out, may not. Uh, it, uh, it just depends. Uh, but what you hear a lot in, uh, you know, this, the whole process now, I think Grok Law is now transitioning. And those of you who haven't seen Grok Law, it's, it's a good thing to look at when you, because it's a, it's a statement of what's happening in patent issues related to open source. Mark Webink, who uh, was at, uh, Red Hat from the beginning uh, is now going to be managing Rock Law. PJ, Pam Jones, 
who's done uh, a remarkable job with that, um, has, is stepping down from day-to-day -day responsibility. Um, but there are a number of sources of information out there. That's just one of them. Uh, but uh, it's an important one. What uh, companies like Microsoft have done is started to engage people to counteract the editorial pieces that come out in places like Rocklaw or opensource.com or other, other places where you're seeing more um, uh, thoughtful contribution uh, and interpretation to help people understand what's happening. Uh, and so you see uh, uh, Flo uh, Florian Mueller, who if, if you want to look at blogs, I, I don't spend a lot of time looking at blogs, but I get them sent to me periodically and I'll look at the headlines. Um, there are a lot of slides on there that, uh, that are cre were created in Redmond that uh, are, uh, will talk about uh, you know, the various uh, litigation, the, for instance, the number of, litig of, uh, of lawsuits that are currently in play related to uh, Android, for example, because the whole notion is to slow Android by saying you, know, you shouldn't take Android as a, as a carrier or as a... Uh, the users don't really care, but as a carrier, you don't want to take Android because it's fraught with problems, or as a vendor, you don't want to standardize on Android because uh, you should standardize on, on, on Windows 7 for mobile or Windows 8 for mobile when it comes out. Um, and so you want to avoid litigation. We're clean, they're dirty. Um, and so it's a, it's a pretty basic strategy of misinformation um, based on a very kernel of, uh, a small kernel of fact that's ultimately been, uh, been uh, blown out to, to the point where it's almost unrecognizable. Uh, but this is, a, this is again, it's, it's part of, the, of the, the, I wouldn't call it a, a war, but the, it's definitely, there are a series of skirmishes that go on on an almost daily basis. Many times during the week I'll get calls from companies who are being asserted against and on Linux grounds, and, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those situations as we go forward. But there are a variety of things that we do. That's really kind of what I call one-on-one -on -one navigational guidance. When people call us and they want to know what should we do, how should we act, uh, who should we hire, um, Software Freedom Law Center provides, uh, provides um, uh, legal support. Uh, Linux Foundation has a legal component to it. Uh, we have dozens of lawyers that we access at some of the largest firms in the world. Um, the one thing that's important is that we don't do this in any, in any kind of, uh, this is too important, Linux is too important, and open source is too important for us to do this on the cheap. We will spend whatever money is necessary to make sure that Linux wins. Unequivocal. Um, this is not a science fair project. This is not something that I don't do this because I, you know, I kind of don't have anything else to do. I do this because I'm committed to the mission of making the making this opportunity space uh, uh, available and ensuring that it doesn't go away because it's just too rich a vein for uh, in in the in the history of human time and how we create value in an economy. This is just too significant, and so we will not. We, we're not looking for headlines. We get them sometimes, but what we're really looking for is for the people who are the creative people at conferences like this and all around the world, for those people to be the ones that, that get the credit, the attention, and, and, and our, our, uh, our understanding of, of, of where the value really sits, that everyone understands where the value sits. Um, it's the kids in, you know, that are participating in, in the... Uh, in the Google uh, Summer of Code, you know, that's, that's, those are the exciting places to, you know, go to an annual, you know, the, the, the meetings where, you know, those kids are, are being brought in. It's an incredible rush to be, to, to kind of see kids starting the process and then as they come through and, and, uh, and, and get uh, nurtured. Uh, we're, we're, we are doing defensive patent sales now. You won't see a lot of mention of this. Uh, I tend not to go out of my way to mention this, but in this environment I will. Um, and since it was brought up, uh, Microsoft had leaked some information about this. We dec I decided I'd clarify it with you today. Uh, and then Linux Defenders, which I'll talk about as well. <laughs> Over 300 patents and applications, they're designed to neutralize threat. They enable Linux development. Many of these are right in the critical path of where Linux is going. Uh, 
we've to try to uh, move things forward. We have 150 defensive publications that, that we've uh, funded or contributed the development of. Um, we'd like to have 10,000 defensive publications uh, because this is essentially the statement that is the, the more of these we get out there, the fewer patents get issued. It's very simple calculus. And for me, broadening this message to the community, if I could do one thing to the, to the development community, it would be to have people at least invent one thing that's in, a, in the form of an acceptable prior art, which is a defensive publication. It can never be used against anyone to restrict their activities. Um, it doesn't give you a negative right the way a patent does at all. It doesn't give you any right. It just states what, what's been invented, and it's accessible and searchable by every patent examiner in the world. Um, Community participation obviously is key here. This is uh, the, the three elements appear to Pat of, uh, of Linux Defenders. One is providing a portal into an existing program called Peer to Patent, which is when there's a published application, you have a period of time to be able to submit the equivalent of what would be information that would be in opposition to the granting of that patent. So before it becomes a patent, once it's published and just visible to the public, we want the community to, to basically come in and, and identify a bunch of prior art so that the, that application can be rejected or its claim scope can be dramatically reduced. And then the other program we have is post-issue peer to patent. So after a patent's been issued, it sh if it should have never been issued because there's a lot of creativity that's out there that's in, uh, that appears in, uh, uh, in, in code uh, or is well known, we're inviting people by putting patents up on post-issue period of patent to contribute prior art so that lawyers can negotiate better agreements with uh, settlements um, that are not gonna be, not gonna have the kind of potentially debilitating effect uh, that, a, that a license might have for a higher royalty rate and make Linux uneconomic or make an open source project uneconomic. Uh, so we're looking here to do requests for re-exams in certain cases. We did one last year with SFLC as the filing entity, but we coordinated behind the scenes to make sure it got done. Uh, we worked with the company and we worked with SFLC to ensure that the, the request for re-exam could be done and, and that will come up soon for, uh, for evaluation. Um, and we're just looking to raise a lot of prior art so that, that cases can either go away or they can, the, the effect of those cases can be minimized. Or potentially, we'll identify patents in people's portfolios that we don't think should have ever been issued and we'll look to have their, the, the claims of those patents significantly weakened by identifying a whole bunch of prior art. And then defensive publications, as I mentioned. Um, and linuxdefenders.org is, is where all this information is. Ways in which we participate. <sighs> Let's see, where are we? I guess we're okay on time. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, this is just kind of a stream of consciousness of a few things that we've done that I threw up that I thought might be interesting. Software tree was a patent being asserted by a troll. Uh, we identified enough art so that the settlement was, I think one one hundredth of what they were originally asking for. Um, and so it was in the like $100,000 or something like that. And what they wanted was to get, you know, millions of dollars from lots of players in the marketplace. Um, and so uh, we contributed art through, through crowdsourcing by, we, we do a whole bunch of prior art searching ourselves. We have experts that are scientific experts and engineers and computer scientists and industry experts <coughs> and then also just search experts. Uh, and then we hire groups as well to do prior art searching. And then we put, the to, to kind of prime the pump, we put some of that up on Linux Defenders and then invite the community. Groklaw would do, do announcements periodically saying, please contribute prior art so that we can, uh, we can limit the effect of this patent. The FAT patent, which is the base of a lot of assertions by Microsoft, um, which is essentially a de facto standard for anytime anyone's interconnecting between heterogeneous networks where one of those networks is a Windows network or an exchange network, um, FAT is essentially the dispositive patent. It's not a very good patent. Um, request for re-exam was done and probably 
uh, there's a lot of complicated elements about how you do re-exams to get a patent invalidated. It's not the easiest thing, and sometimes it's not your fault. It just doesn't come out well. That was one of those situations where uh, five years ago when it was done, or yeah, it was about five, four and a half years ago, um, it, uh, the, the result was not good. It ended up, it ended up uh, reinforcing the validity of the patent, which was the opposite intent. Vernetics is an active troll, has one of the large, it's a very significant patent portfolio. Their settlement against Microsoft was uh, a couple of hundred million dollars, uh, and they have the potential to get settlements like that against lots of other people. Uh, so we're looking to weaken that portfolio so that it doesn't affect the Linux community. PHP patents and biometric patents, we, t we bought recently two very large portfolios, um, in, well, significant dollar portfolios. The PHP patents, the f everybody in this room views a PHP page every day or they write one or they, they host one if they have a company. Uh, and uh, PHP is ubiquitous. Um, and so we have the fundamental patent that covers PHP. We didn't buy it because it's a stopper against Microsoft or anyone else. We bought it purely to enable the community um, because anyone who creates a PHP page needs this. And this is the value of this, this patent is uh, probably well over $250 million uh, because in the wrong hands, it would, it would in, be, in, be involved in serial litigation against hundreds of companies, uh, mostly large companies that's, that uh, social networking companies and, uh, and companies that, uh, that do a lot of transactions would be the first target online, and then people who just display content. Everybody is vulnerable to this pat these patents. We bought them, we make them available freely to anyone who wants a license. And we encourage anyone from the smallest company to the largest company to take a license. We have uh, 371 licensees right now, um, and they include the original six companies in OIN, they also include Oracle and, and Google and, and uh, uh, um, Canonical and uh, HP and Fujitsu and a whole range of large companies as well as, uh, as Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Salesforce.com, this is a situation that we uh, were involved in. Uh, Salesforce.com was being approached uh, by Microsoft and asserted against on uh, 14 patents. Six of the patents were focused on, uh, uh, on Linux, alleged to be Linux related patents, um, and uh, Salesforce had precious few patents in their portfolio. They're the classic antelope target that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and they're also very squeaky. Uh, Mark Benioff is essentially a uh, <coughs> The apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree. Mark Benioff worked for uh, Larry Ellison for quite some time and has a stylistic approach that is uh, equally combative. Um, and so by continuing to assault, uh, at least verbally, uh, Microsoft for so long, finally they said, all right, we'll sue these guys and put them in their place. Uh, not realizing that the, the fatal error they were making was actually raising the Linux element. We provided, uh, we spent six months mapping and matching patents and making sure that their, client, their, their counsel was comfortable. Lit assertions go on for a long time before they get to litigation. Litigation was coming and they were being told it was coming. So we essentially, uh, they're all, there's a lot of nuance to this, but you have to have, if you want to be able to get an injunction, which against a large cash, bear, cash machine like Microsoft or Apple or somebody like that, you need to have patents that read on what they do, but also read on what you do. There's an eBay ruling that came out a few years ago that requires this if you want to get an injunction. And you don't want to be a gnat if you're going to use patents. You want to actually you know, have, be a wasp and leave, leave a mark. And so uh, the only way to do that is to get an injunction. That gets people's attention. Uh, settlement, $50 million, $100 million, $200 million is meaningless to to companies like Apple and, and Microsoft at this juncture. Uh, and so you have to be able to enjoin products that are high value products that generate profitability. Um, they have a lot of businesses. It's very easy when you're as large as they are to generate top line. It's very hard to generate profitability. 
um, because still the franchise is where they generate most of their, most of their revenue and profit. Um, so you need patents that read on the franchise. So we sold four patents to Salesforce. Salesforce uh, immediately advised through Mark Benioff, immediately advised uh, uh, the people at, uh, in, at Redmond that uh, they now had our patents and they were prepared to get more, so they better back off. Uh, I got a call from Microsoft immediately after that saying, hey, what are you guys doing? And I said, we're gonna do this every time you raise, you raise Linux in litigation. We have no problem with you asserting your port portfolio that's non-Linux related, but we think a lot of your Linux related stuff is not really Linux related, but you're creating a specter. Um, you're building, it's what I call their totem strategy. They have large totems they wanna build and put out in front of their Redmond headquarters with, with the logos of large companies that have allegedly taken uh, Linux licenses. In point of fact, most companies that take Linux licenses, they're throw-ins and they're, they just throw them in. They never even look at the, what are alleged to be Linux-related patents. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a rather neat and elegant strategy that they have to try to create a perception that this, they're the center of the Linux space from a patent standpoint, which they're not. Uh, and so uh, they were sued three days later uh, and uh, miraculously all of the, uh, the Linux-related patents were pulled from the, the, from the assertion and they weren't part of the litigation. And uh, the settlement occurred two weeks later. So uh, it was a situation that would have never settled in that time frame uh, because they were the classic vulnerable company. TomTom, Tom, the next one I'll talk about, TomTom had some of its own patents that read on Microsoft. They didn't need our patents, but they did need the connection and relationship for potential, the, the specter of us being able to provide more patents to them. Uh, TomTom was uh, uh, before, uh, uh, really before the Android platform, uh, which has kind of made TomTom less relevant. TomTom Tom was the uh, kind of the Kleenex of Europe for, uh, and st still is very popular for the, the navigation space. And so they had just over leveraged themselves by buying a, uh, uh, one of the, the two most significant uh, mapping companies in the world. Um, and uh, it was common knowledge because they're a public company that they had to reschedule their debt uh, and three weeks later, they were sued by uh, Microsoft after it was announced that they had to reschedule their debt. So rescheduling the debt means they're vulnerable. They couldn't service their debt at, at the certain levels because the market was, they were in the middle of the, were in the middle of the financial crisis and the market was dipping. And so, because uh, there was less discretionary income being used on these kinds of products during that period two years ago. And so uh, Microsoft attacked them uh, with the fat patent and, uh, didn't seem to have any intention of settling. We announced a license. Uh, there'd been no movement from the original request, which was for a very significant dollar figure. We announced a license, and four days later, uh, Microsoft settled, uh, and uh, settled for a very small percentage of what was, it, it's something that's, when you're a public company, you have a requirement to reveal material settlements in litigation. Uh, because the, the taxpayer or the, the investors have a right to know. It wasn't material by uh, uh, standards of the, uh, of the, the um, uh, Amsterdam exchange. So I think that tells you that it was a rather insignificant settlement that Microsoft got in that situation. Microsoft also, two year, or a year and a half ago, two years ago, was attempting to package up patents with a bunch of claim charts um, showing reads on a variety of open source products, in Linux in particular. Um, we worked with another uh, patent management organization called uh, Allied Security Trust to have them buy the patents on our behalf and then they flowed through to us uh, because Microsoft was, did, purposely did not show them to us because they wanted to sell them to Allied Security Trust because everything that Allied Security Trust gets, they have to sell on to trolls. So it was essentially a money laundering, patent laundering scheme, not money laundering, but it's the same concept. You launder the patents, you remove the, the stink of your own, your own uh, behaviors, and it actually is, is a relative good guy defensive patent purchaser that doesn't have a mandate. Our mandate is to support the entire community in a way of life. AST and RPX are patent management organizations that support clubs of companies. They have no obligation to anyone else except those club members, which is very different from what we do. 
And so anyway, this is just an example of how we participate. There are a variety of other things that we do on a regular basis. Um, but um, for us, it's this, this whole notion of discontinuity and the idea of increasing returns or network effects uh, is really what we're trying to get to, to, tra to make sure there are no subluxations or, or bottlenecks that discourage the free flow of, of ideas and the, and the creation mo modality that we have around these platforms that I've talked about because new novelty creates much more value in an economy. Discontinuous innovations, this is what we're, things that radically re redefine existing markets or create new ones, this is what we're looking to see more of in the in the open source community, and we have great hope. There's great hope that that can occur. I mean, just look at the from the original introduction of of one of uh, of Apple's most elegant failures, uh, much like the Lisa, the uh, the Newton that was introduced in uh, in '94, late '94, uh, was a uh, a great product to show us where we could go a horrible product in terms of sales, and everybody thought John Scully was an idiot, but John Scully was not an idiot. Uh, John Scully knew that you have to have directional products to be able to help uh, provide some, some understanding to a community to kind of rethink how you, you interface and use technology. That was the beginning of the PDA, uh, the first effective PDA of the type that we currently use and call smartphones now, uh, and from then on, uh, Donna Dubinsky's team really over the next 10 years refined and developed uh, a less complex version that was, that was consistent with where networks were at that particular point in terms of capability and content um, and allowed for the migration to the point we're at now. So uh, it really, if we look back to the origins, it, it was an, a wonderfully elegant uh, failure but it's something that created a, a different way for us to interact with information um, well beyond the, uh, the hegemony of the, of the PC. And Linux Defenders, as I said earlier, we've got this other activity going on where the community is using defensive publications. I think we can live in the slipstream of that because patent, managed, patent examiners at the PTO in the US and everywhere around the world, they're looking for these defensive publications, these statements of prior art, because they are, they, are, they are interested in issuing fewer patents, especially in the US. Um, they'd like to, but they're having difficulty getting there, and so they need help from the community. Whatever happens on, uh, on, uh, in terms of whatever Congress produces as a, as a reform act for intellectual property, we can't count on that addressing the needs of this community in particular or of any community really because uh, it's always filled with compromise and you have to meet legislation and, le and regulatory reform halfway. The same is true for ju judicial reform. Uh, it can't be counted on to do all the work. The community has to meet it halfway. And so my view is absent participation from the community. Uh, we're not going to get the prior art out there. We're going to have continuing issues with patents. Um, what I want to do is, is develop ways through Linux Defenders of dealing with the past, the present, and the future of patenting so that patents represent less of a thorn in our side. We've got billions of dollars that's seeping into uh, the patent speculation world where patent trolls are now acquiring patents purely for the purpose of, of not adding any value except participating in the arbitrage opportunities of, 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 of litigation. It, it costs you three and a half to five million dollars to defend a lawsuit in the U.S., and it costs you eight to twelve million dollars to defend an ITC action. That combined amount, which is what what TomTom Tom was facing, by, by the way, uh, is crippling. It forces you to alter your decisions about what choices and technology you're going to make. It's a, it's a question of survival or Linux. You're going to choose survival because your your ultimate obligation is to your shareholders even if you have to limp along. Um, and so, I mean, look at Nokia, Yahoo. Uh, I mean, the, there are very difficult decisions to be made, um, and it's hard to completely fault companies for making uh, what I think time will, will show us was the wrong decision. But at the time, in the, indiv indiv in the individual moment, it's very hard to say that those, those were the incorrect decisions because everything is so contextual. Uh, I just know that Nokia and Yahoo will be very different companies five years from now. And so 
we're looking to try and get more people to continue to participate in this crowdsourcing initiative, identify more art, and help us create more art so that fewer patents get issued in the future. Help us with this, this notion of, of creating the antidote for the patent excess that we've had over the last 20 years, which is the, uh, the idea of, of creating value and codifying it so that fewer things ultimately get issued. Does anybody have any questions? I think we have a couple of minutes. Yes. It's all those six companies. IBM, Red Hat, Novell, Sony, Neck, and Philips. They get, uh, they sign the exact same license that someone who pays zero dollars gets. This is a very weird, from a business standpoint, that's why I said it's unheard of. There's no precedent for OIN. It's the whitest of white hat organizations um, designed to essentially make sure that this transition to an open source world is effective. Yes. Yeah, Google is, uh, we have a very, very close relationship with Google and Google is, uh, uh, we support the, the Android platform, not to the expense of, of WebOS or, or Mego, if Mego ever gets off the ground, or Limo for that matter. But Google's, uh, Google's, you know, there are two things going on. One is <coughs> Google's success and its diversification of business strategy means that it, it is becoming, it's going through a process that's similar to what Cisco went through in the, in the late 90s when Mike Volpe was buying a company every six and a half weeks. A lot of those companies were the vehicle for Cisco to build up an IP portfolio. Um, in this case, they're not pursuing an acquisition strategy of, ent of small, medium-sized entities. They're, pr they're pursuing an acquisition of large portfolios to be able to give them a position of relative uh, strength uh, because they need, they need balance. This is my perception from the outside in. And then in the open source world, um, they're, they're, what they've done with, with Android is, uh, I think, phenomenal in terms of uh, pursuing and advancing a strategy designed to encourage uptake of, a, of an open source platform. So uh, they're very, very much involved and I, I think they're transitioning to become more, um, a different kind of IP company than they were before in terms of intellectual property is more important to them now than it was five years ago. Yes. Yeah, no, that, that's fine, it's a good question and it helps, you know, I live in this world all the time so you, you kind of catch me up to reality. It's essentially an idea. If you had an idea and you didn't, and you put it in code but you didn't put it in some place that's searchable so that it could serve as, if there's prior art on something, like I claim that I have the ability, like going back to my example from before, <laughs> this is a good one. ActiveSync is a patent that Microsoft owns. It's a series of, of 10 patents. Anytime your device, your portable device, syncs at the same time as your, uh, as your desktop, there's a patent or a series of patents that cover that activity. If I had published something three years prior to Microsoft filing the patents on ActiveSync that said that this concept is something that I believe is possible and it can occur, where you, when you have a device, you have a synchronization activity that occurs in such and such a way, that's prior art. Or you, you have a discovery at a university that you put a paper out on and you've got a series of, of slides or you've done, a pa uh, you've done a, a formal paper. That can all serve as prior art. There's a, there's a, there's a site called uh, uh, IP.com, which is a repository for structured content that's where we will pay to have, we'll take the equivalent of an electronic cocktail napkin, turn it into a defensive publication, and then pay for it to be hosted. That's a site that's, that's listed, that's on a, it's a desktop click-through on every patent examiner's desktop in the world. So that's what prior art is. It's essentially a prior statement of an invention. It doesn't have to be that detailed, it's just you can do this, this, and this 
you can communicate between heterogeneous networks, you can create security that requires somebody to send a message to somebody else that they're sending it and the other person to send a message back saying that, they that they're prepared to receive. May anything that you can think of, you could think of a hundred, a hundred things right now that go on every day in technology that we use and chances are they're, they're all covered by patents. Because whenever you create a product, you're creating usually a set of patents if you're a large company, especially if you're an engineering company. If you're a computer science driven company, not so much because it's not part of the culture, it's not part of the history. Any other questions? I think we have one minute. Well, you, you have to have, you have to have published the art in some way that made it accessible. So if you kept it in a closed circuit, so to speak, of five or six people, but it actually had no public availability, then it wouldn't serve as prior, effective prior art, even though it did predate maybe the, the invention. Sure. I, I, didn't, I didn't catch the beginning of the question, sorry. Uh, because the license actually, we're creating community. It's an attempt to kind of show unity. And when we have, instead of 370 plus licensees and we have 5,000 licensees, the people on this side of the table and the people on this side of the table, it starts to show that the world has shifted. So we're looking for a palpable evidence, a statement of people who are joining the community. And ownership is very important to us because it also, that's why we don't contribute them to or pledge them somewhere like the Linux Patent Commons. Um, we need ownership because then we have the ability to forward deploy them for defensive purposes. Then they have that uh, additional benefit. So anyway, thank you very much. I can help with I like it. it. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? Like you gave me a I good found idea. problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with it. Really? Who would have thought of that? Let's put the word out. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. OS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS. HP.